And that in itself, although you have worked on it for 15 years, somebody else needs to now work on, on it for the next 15 years. And where is the policy in place to be able to fund somebody to do it for 15 years, or a person also expected to do it of their own initiative in the way that you've been able to do this? And is it really fair to have somebody traverse the journey that you've had to traverse for the past 15 years to be able to create those maps? Is it not going to be, is it not relevant to have a policy in place that in itself fosters this kind of mapping committee. So that's the first thing. The second thing you touched upon is about pinching. Copyright. If you want to protect art creators, musicians, dancers, choreographers, craftsmen, painters, and if you think you're going to be able to do it via copyright, well, I don't think you can. And I don't think we can ever really have a copyright situation. And I think it's absolutely anachronistic with the very nature of an organically growing art form. Because we rely on being influenced by each other. She strikes a note in a particular way. I like it. I'm going to emulate it. What are you going to do about it? I, somebody wants to sing in the style of somebody else, and you can't stop that person from singing in that person's style, even if, even if he or she is not a Gandaband Shishya of that particular singer. You can't certainly stop that person from being inspired. What are you going to do? What happens if she reproduces the performance verbatim? Tan after tan after tan, and she reproduces it exactly. What do you say? Congratulations, or do you say, how dare you? I mean, imitation is at one level the greatest kind of homage that you can give to another performer, isn't it? It depends on how you actually look at these things. There are community regulations. We have communitarian knowledge systems. Policing culture is extremely difficult, and especially in countries like India. I think even so, if we were to even try and have some modern protection for artists, again, you would need a policy to be able to do that. You can't really imagine that you're going to do bend the rule for one and not have a, a policy that can be used across the board. We keep saying India needs a cultural policy. <laughs> Actually, there is there are few countries in the world that have as much culture as India does already. We are one of the most, we have one of the richest rep repertoires of cultural policies anywhere in the world. You go to the United States to borrow an art object for an exhibition. You don't know who to deal with. There isn't a ministry of culture with a joint secretary in charge of museums who you can talk to who will give you permission to be able from the American museums for your art exhibition. You have to write to individual curators, individual museums. Every individual museum has its own policy. It's federalism to the... Everyone is an autonomous body and an organization in their own right. There isn't a unifying policy at all. But India has cultural institutions which is the academy, set of academies that are sponsored by the American government for the present American folklore and American dance traditions and a musical tradition. You have one particular symphony, monic, and they have to live on lottery money that they have to ga gain for themselves in Britain these days. The government doesn't sponsor, they are expected to apply to the national lottery to support the Arts Council of Britain. Directors and deputy directors and chairpersons of the arts organizations of the Western world have to make funding applications for the continuity of their own organizations at the moment. Their governments don't support them. The only countries in the world that have such a huge government investment and rules and regulations for the sponsorship of the arts exists, in fact, only in India to unquantifiable levels, in fact, because the number of 
archaeology ministries that look after culture in state governments and in national governments, if you added the salaries of all of those people who work in state administration, administration in culture-related aspects, it is such a huge deployment of resources that the nation is putting out, apart from in just manpower. There are few governments in the world that have a policy to such an extent for the sponsorships and the preservation and the maintain, maintenance of assets that anywhere in the world, if the government of India dried up its resources and stopping to do that, if we were hit by recessionary econom economics like you have in Western societies, where the first casualty every time there is an economic downturn is drying up money for the arts. The British Museum was on its knees because they had to have retrenchment. We can't find positions. We have allocated salaries in the National Museum, but we don't have personnel to fill us. The British Museum is imposing retrenchment. As a gallery can be opened, the gallery can be opened only once a week for visitors to come and see it. Because they can't pay so hards to be available in the gallery and afford their salaries. The government refuses to do that because afford the salaries for so many people. To be able to make the gallery available to people. We can't find people to fill our positions. So I think we're spoiled. We're a nation of complainers, but we're not really looking forward to actually seeing what blessings we are born under and how much we actually have and how we can use the resources of what we already have cons made constitutionally available to us and turn it to our advantage to make it be more productive. I think that's the critical thing. How can we, the rot that exists, and there's no denying the extent of the rot that exists, but the rot is not going to get fixed by adding more. The rot is going to be fixed by cleaning up. And I think we need to figure out ways in which how we're going to do better housekeeping and clean what we already have, rather than add more to what we have. And I think the first step towards that can only come if we recognize the extraordinary importance of soft politics and of culture in the cultural, in, in the politics of the world, in international relations. What an extraordinary power it has. I'll give you an example. In uh, 2001, I was a curator at the British and one of my, I was doing something in one of the showcases in the Indian Art Gallery and my departmental secretary came running downstairs and says that there is um, the Guardian Observer's uh, war correspondent has called from a satellite phone from Bagram Airfield. This is 2001, the Allied forces had just gone into Afghanistan. And uh, she said that they will call back in 20 minutes. Can you be at your desk? They need a quotation from you for the papers. So I went back to my desk and I was baffled, very young. It was time I have to give an official response, not on behalf of the government of India, but on the behalf of the British Museum as an employee of the British government. And I would be expected to make a that would be reported in the national broadsheets. Um, it was, I was, what must have been 26, 27, uh, maybe, and it was slightly uh, galling. And I had, I had this war correspondent ring me up, and he described what he was seeing. He says, I'm in the control tower, and all around me I can see stealth bombers, carpet bombing, Bagram airfield. And I said, well, Bagram, which is the same as what we had, art, as art historians, been taught about as Begram, a very ancient and important site of Afghanistan, which had been excavated for, for, for the French. And it had the most priceless uh, objects of glass and Indian ivory and uh, uh, Greek and Roman the gods and goddesses had all been found together, uh, which must have belonged to some trader in Afghanistan in his strong room underground. They found things from all over the world that were lying there which had all been collected before 200 AD. Begram, which had been the crucible of civilization containing precious objects from all over the world where the French were unable to complete their excavations. Today those sites 
lie, lie carpet bombed. And he's describing the carpet bombing to me. And I was so appalled at what he was narrating from that control tower that I, I couldn't stop from expressing my horror. The tragedy was that despite the cultural mapping that had been done by the British in the 1940s, yet this travesty was being, was, was, was being enacted before one where they were unsympathetically bombing Afghanistan. What use was the cultural mapping in that case, where you can't take informed decisions? The cry was raised. As a result, I gave a very strong quote about the matter. Not that my little quote would have made any difference. Others um, spoke, spoke about it. Well, I just spoke about what it was and how important it was for the British government to be able. And there's so much for the past 40, 50 years we'd known about the importance of Begram, and yet, despite our mapping, it was being, it was being carpet bombed. Um, but what happened as a cumulative result of me and a few other people and speaking about it was that the American training for soldiers had to be changed. And you now look up their websites, Army, and you can actually see information on how policies have been brought in to train soldiers as to what they are supposed to do when they go into the war theater and how they are supposed to protect cultural assets. It's become a well-known fact that whenever a war breaks out, you can create maximum damage in Syria, for instance, by bombing the great mosque of Damascus. By putting one bomb on the Taj Mahal, you will destroy the morale and the spine of India, because the great symbol of India has gone, even though nobody lives there. You are not causing a casualty to millions of lives, but you have destroyed something symbolically. One bomb at a strategic location in the Twin Towers, and the reverberations of that will be felt forevermore, not because of the however many people died, but because of the symbolic act of the destruction of that monument can send a, a, the symbolic effect of that is huge. How does a government, therefore, train its armed forces be able to protect cultural assets. Unless the maps exist, there will be no such policy. Unless these casualties are met with regularly, we won't know what to do with these situations. I think we need to understand something else. The next point I wanted to talk about. Why is it that we have such a hard time filling the positions in the National Museum, in the academies of the state government. Why are there no trained personnel? Why aren't there enough educated people who are practitioners of dance as well as theoreticians who've done doctoral work, who've done masters and MPhils and whatever else and have theoretical knowledge in the performing arts as well as uh, in the practice of dance, applying for the very positions in the state academies that exist all over the country. Why aren't there enough curatorial positions being filled today in the museums of India by people in the art historians? Why is that? These are systemic issues. We have things in place, but they're not being filled by trained persons. And actually, we have remarkably few places in which training is being imparted. The great policy crisis exists largely because we have no one, we don't have enough personnel to fill those positions, but there's another reason. <laughs> Why is it that civil servants seem to think that getting a posting in a department of archaeology and culture is a punishment? If they're being, if they're, they're no longer the government doesn't seem to think that getting a culture pol posting is a worthy posting. It means that a politician seems to think that his least worthy member in the state cadre should be given the culture, culture, give him archaeology, give him something like that where he won't interfere with the functioning of the state. Why give him an important position like commerce or industries or 
you know, irrigation and agriculture are yeah, hugely important portfolios. Fisheries is an important portfolio. But the cultural assets of the country are not an important portfolio. Now, it's interesting to see how you have policy in the sense like, let's look at council functions, how the Alliance Francaise functions, how the Gata Institute functions. Um, these major cultural institutions use the cultural assets of their country in other countries. In a, how much does the Tagore Institute in Berlin or how much does the Nehru Center in London, how much do these cultural outposts that we, how much do on the same footing? Are they as rich? Are they able to use soft politics and diplomacy in quite the same way? What all does British, the British Council do in India? How many regional centers does it have in India and how much is it able to achieve in India in terms of the cultural dissemination that it manages? not just of British and English speaking in India, but also for Indian culture within India, but within the British Council's rubric. I don't see the ICCR being able to do anything quite like in terms of, of sponsoring as being the Indian sponsor for British art at the Nehru Center. No. And yet so much of happens at the Alliance Francaise and at the Max Müller Bhavan. If these two institutions stopped promoting art in, in Delhi, what a ma major loss it would be. And forget about what they're doing in Chennai and what they're doing in Pondicherry and what they're doing in, in Bombay and, and so on. I think we tend to forget that on the one hand, we are a country where in terms of policy, we are desperate for tourism, but we don't seem that tourism is entirely the cultural assets of the country. If there were no great craft maps for the tourists to use, there would be no purchasing going on. We talk about the agricultural sector, but few people talk about the fact that all agriculturalists don't perform agriculture for 100% of their time, that for a significant part of their time, the same people are engaged in producing craft, in dancing, in preserving musical traditions, etc. And if agricultural ministries and if subsidies are not going to be guided to those people, we have an economic, I mean, we have crisis in this country. So it's not just tourism that we're talking about. Um, it's not just an elite preservation of cultural policy and mapping of assets that is required for a few cognizant Delhi, but we're actually talking about something that needs to be urgently implemented for the sake of India, for the sake of its foreign policy, as well as for the sake of its domestic <laughs> relations of its economic welfare of the state. If there isn't a culture policy that is hand in glove with an economy, I don't think the culture, the country can actually Yet at the same time, in the name of transparency and efficiency, we seem to have taken upon ourselves very retrogressive, or regressive rather, uh, implementation of many things. We seem to find it impossible even now to have a 24-7 channel of Hindustani music, despite the fact that the All India Radio has the world's largest archives of music, of Hindustani music, but a private radio Gandharv came up and ran till its platform of satellite dried up in India and they didn't get a satellite radio extension in India. But the Prasad Bharti has not yet been able to achieve a 24-7 channel of music that is nationally broadcast. Um, it, despite having the world's largest library available, copyrighted, available to them, how difficult can it be when all over the world you have Radio 3 in Britain with constant 24 hours of, uh, of, of, of classical music going on. You can listen to classic FM at the same time. And if you get on to get online, there are how many channels of 24 hours Western classical music being by God knows how many countries in the Western world. But there isn't a single one in India of South Asian classical musical traditions. There isn't one that you can hear, not even on the internet. And there are, I think it's the, the, in, a, in an age like today when it isn't very difficult, when the kind of, of software that's even available to, be, to DJs to be able to merge and match 
musical rhythms and beats and note patterns to be able to smoothly transit from one piece of music in the computer's memory and archive into the next piece of music. You don't even need educated radio jockeys that you used to have in the days of yore, where you used to have such intelligent curation of music was required. I mean, technology has come to such an extent where it can be used in such a easy way to help radio channels function like this. I think I mention only a few of these lacunae. <laughs> the greatest one, of course, is the Antiquities and Art Treasures Act of 1972. It's one of the most regressive measures in cultural policy in the history of the world. I mean, it was badly needed in 1972. Mrs. Gandhi had withdrawn privy purses. There was a danger that the royal families of India would be selling off the cultural assets abroad. And so she rallied UNESCO, an international policy to be able to protect assets of India them within the country by coming up with an international regulation of which principal signatory to make the export art from countries like India contraband. So art from India became illegal to be traded, art which was in the nature of anything over a hundred years old, became be traded outside India after 1972. If it had left India before 1972, it was okay. But when you make policies like that, you've also got to make sure that you open up a domestic market because it's not that art stopped getting discovered in India after 1970. The pace of urbanization in India, which is becoming, you know, we've all seen people live. You all know, I mean, we live in, the, in an age when we have the greatest amount of urbanization going on in India at the moment. Fields are being constantly turned into many cities. And as these cities are getting developed, more and more archaeological artifacts, beautiful sculptures, ancient temples are appearing that we never had before. Tube wells are being dug, are being dug, dams are being constructed, roads are being made all over this country, highways are being made, metros are constructed in the world's oldest cities. Do you think there'll be no archaeological discoveries being take, taking place? And yet the Delhi metro has not reported even the discovery of one pottery fragment from Indraprasth and Hastinapur, not one pottery piece, not even one coin. Is that even possible? that you're digging in Meheroli and you're digging in South Delhi and you're digging near Indraprasth and you're not discovering something? Is that even possible? The pace at which things are appearing on the grey market, I have never seen art dealers' coffers so full as I have seen them in the past 15-20 years in India. There are more archaeological artifacts that are coming up in the black market and in the archaeological, uh, in the grey market at the moment than there have been ever, I think, than there have ever been. And all of these objects cannot legally be purchased by the growing economy of the world, by Indians themselves freely, because we are supposed to have these terribly diluvian forms that we are supposed to fill in for the registration of your antiquities. Every artifact that's more than 100 years old has to be registered. We live in 2018, that means anything made before 1914 has to be registered. Is that even possible? My watch is made in 19. Grandfather's watch, I mean, what am I going to do? Is it going to be registered? Is every woman... And then place of domicile and keeping... Well, hold on. On the one hand, you have a concept like communitarian. You have tribals and Adivasis in this country who don't believe in private property, in communal ownership. The only private property that they have is the jewelry that they wear and the ancient that they have. The things that we today value as important crafts. Every woman in India has a right to stridhan, movable property. What happens with Sridhan? Are you going to be registering each piece of your grandmother's jewellery that you and your mother-in-law's jewellery that you've inherited? But the fact of the matter is that every Indian woman makes it her birthright to destroy all jewellery she's inherited and to re refashion it because she doesn't want to wear it in that style and she modernizes the jewellery she's inherited. But what are you doing? It's act Technically, it's an antiquity. You tamper with it. It's over a hundred years old. 
you can't be taking out the stones from your mother-in-law's jewelry and recasting it into something else. It's an illegal act at the moment. We have, we have to think in terms of culture policy to be able to think about where uh, we've implemented, we've over, -legisl we've over legislated. The problem is not that we don't have policies, we have perhaps any policies. We've got, we're still really not out of the license raj in this country. We don't value subjectivity adequately. We don't value knowledge. We want everything to be in such a way that the government servant will sit there and you are supposed to go to him with an application form for something. We have applied to him, we can't award you. If you haven't applied, then you can't get a CD. If you haven't applied, then you can't get a CD. But no, my work is not to be able to exercise my brain, to be able to go looking for talent. To, solving the, to be able to go solve the problem. My job is to sit there and expect applications to come to me which I'm going to vet. And that is the greatest problem in the country at the moment. That we don't have a policy that is going to keep the instruments, the people who are meant to implement policy, educated and alive. That's the biggest shortcoming. That's the only policy that's actually lacking is the education of the civil servant. So how do we actually achieve that in the country? Coming down to, the, to brass tacks, how do we actually fix this problem? And to my mind, the only thing can really be implemented is a small gesture, for instance, if more and more people rallied around to ask the UPSC to make art history and culture into an entrance exam. After all, the UGC has now recognized culture and art history as a popularized subject all over the country. University departments are now being created. Let me give you a very sparator. What has China done? To, China became aware of exactly the same problem and they tried to fix it. They realized that the largest buyers for Chinese art, the greatest sympathizers for Chinese culture are not Westerners, but are Chinese people themselves. So what they did was they created over a hundred faculties for Chinese art and culture in China. They made the importation of Chinese art into China completely duty free. They encouraged the world's auctioneers, Sotheby's and Christie's and others to come and set up shop in China to sell Chinese art in China. What these companies started doing was they started hoovering up the greatest pieces of Chinese art in the West and started offering the people for sale in China itself. Now, China, like India, is experiencing the greatest amount of development and urbanization. They know that they are discovering more sites than they have they, their archaeological service can deal with. But they know that the minute they excavate a site, it's not just about excavation, it's about dissemination. After you excavate a site, you have to protect that site, you have to construct a museum there. How do you construct so many museums? Who's going to man those museums? Like we have a crisis of personnel, know that they have a crisis of personnel. So they have 100 faculties. And so it's interesting that they have invested in education because they know within years they will have a cadre of trained professionals to look after those cultures that they are discovering. Unfortunately, a 15-year horizon is more than the four-year horizon that our politicians seem to think with. And we have to get out of the policy of four to five-year horizon, which is what we are geared only to think in a four to five-year horizon till the next election. We can't seem to think of policy, 15-year policy. And I think that... That's really the kind of thing that we need to think about as to how we are going to actually start thinking with a slightly longer duration to be able to